Hallelujah. Glory to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, it's time to change. It's time to change our ways that are not in alignment with your ways, Lord. So, Father, we stand here with an open mind and an open heart. And Holy Spirit, only you speak. Holy Spirit, only you speak. Let, Lord, let not no man or woman in this room or watching by, by video would hear my voice or see me. But, Lord, you be magnified. You be seen. Lord, I am, I am not perfect. I have my failures and my weaknesses, Lord. So, Lord, you go before us all. You go before me, Lord. I, I'm, I'm frail and I'm weak, Father. But, Lord, I trust in you that you will speak to your people, Lord. You do use your people as instruments, as tools of righteousness, Lord. Lord, I trust you, Lord, that the work that you were doing, Lord, that your word that you send out will not return void. I trust, Father, that that you are doing a wonderful work in the lives of these people here, your people, Lord. And Lord, you speak to those watching by video, Father, that they would be touched and penetrated by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And Holy Spirit, you move and you bring salvation all to the glory of the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's time to change is the title of the sermon this morning. Now, this message is going to speak to two types of, uh, several types of people, but two in particular. One, to the Christian who can get caught up in spiritual pride and complacency. And what does complacency mean? It's a feeling of quiet pleasure or security, often while unaware of some potential danger that lies ahead. And so it also speaks to number two. It speaks to the beaten down. Those who are just broken, they're beaten down and, and they're at the end of the rope. And that may be a Christian as well, and it may not be a Christian, but they're beaten down by, by, by the trials and the temptations and the things of the world. And so it's time to change. It's time to go to Jesus. It's time for all of us to go to Jesus. I want to read to you three stories of three tax collectors. Now, in biblical days, a tax collector was a very rich person, a very rich man. I mean, they were loaded. The Roman government would entrust these Jewish men to tax the Jewish people. And they were known, these tax collectors were known to overtax people. Because, for example, they would tell a tax collector, the Roman government expects this much out of you per month. And after that, you can keep the rest to yourself. And so you had an idea that they would have a field day with this. They would set up a booth on the side of a road, and they would tax people for walking down a Roman road. You know, you name it. These tax collectors had a field day. So these tax collectors were very rich because nobody, who, who was going to tell them anything? They had the authority and the power of the Roman government, the most powerful nation on the earth at the time. And the Romans were known to be very brutal. And so the Romans were going to get their fees. And these tax collectors were going to make sure. And so these tax collectors were in charge with taxing their own people. And so think about it. At the end of the day, when the tax collector goes to their house, they're not very liked. They're not well received. You see the tax collector going into the Jewish temple to pray. Nobody wants to stand around him because they think he's a hypocrite. He wants to talk to God, but yet he just, he, he taxes us. He has no heart. He's cold. So these people were the bottom of the barrel. They were the scum of the earth probably. But yet they were loaded down with a lot of money. And so, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to talk to you with three examples of, the, of, of these tax collectors. In Luke chapter 18, verse 10 talks about two men who went up to the temple. They went up to the temple to pray. Now, this was in Jerusalem. It was not in a synagogue. It was in the temple. It was in Jerusalem itself. It says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, a religious man and a tax collector, a Pharisee who knew the word of God. A Pharisee is one who served God in the temple. 
The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. He was saying in the temple, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, that I'm not a swindler, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, or I'm not even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance in the way, probably in the back pew, was unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his own chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. Now, This is a warning. A lot of Christians can find themselves like this Pharisee. Where we, we are doing the Christian thing. We're going to Bible studies. We're doing all the things that, which are good to do. Everything that this Pharisee was doing was good. There was nothing wrong with it. But when we do things at the command of God, what God orders us, commands us through his word, and now even now through a relationship with Jesus Christ, when his word commands us and leads us to live a certain lifestyle and to do certain things, you know, it's very easy for the Christian today to get caught up in a spiritual pride and find out that we do things for the wrong reason. And that's a very dangerous place to be, church, because... Many have fallen. The, the Bible says that pride comes before the fall. When we get prideful, a fall is soon to come. And so this tax collector, and I've already explained to you about the tax collector, they were so, he was so beaten down. <coughs> he was so distraught. He was so upset with how he had lived his life. You know, think about it. This tax collector had made some bad decisions in his life. He was probably very harsh to people. He was, he, 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 he was at the end of his own wit. He, he was tired of the way he had lived his life. He was tired of being tired. And you know, I think that's, you know, it's, you don't want to be there, but sometimes you end up there where you're just tired of being tired. You're tired of doing things in your own strength. And your own understanding. You're tired of just trying to seek a good life, but yet you come to the same place where you first started. And this tax collector had had it. He had had it with his life. He had had it with his career. He had had it with everything. He was fed up. But just like today, you know, people, when they're in trouble, they run to God. Amen? Amen? They do. When you're sick, you run to God. When you're sick, you pray to God. When your baby's sick, you go to God. Whenever something is wrong, you, you just have a natural instinct to run to God. Amen. Run to church. And the Lord is faithful. As a pastor, I've seen people do that. And then when things get better, they just they go back. But you see, this tax collector wasn't there anymore. He had probably done this before, but at this time, he came to a place where he was beating his own chest. He, he, he was tired of the pride that he had had so long. He was tired of, of chasing things that were never there. And he realized that he was a sinner. You see... To be a Christian is to realize that how, how you are a sinner. You know, think about it. Why is it that so many Christians today, you know, people who claim to be Christians, they, they just backslide and go back into the world? You know, I believe we can touch on something that many of them never realized that they were a sinner. They never realized the danger of their sin. They never realized that they were, had truly fallen short of the glory of God. 
I mean, think about it. You know, and that's really hard for kids who grow up in the church. Because they grow up in the church surrounded by the goodness of God. They don't really do anything bad. They just grow up, they're going to church all the time, and that's why some of those types of kids end up in the pits of hell. Not all of them, but some of them. But it's so important that no matter whether you were raised in church or whether you were not raised in church, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have to realize that we, we have a sin problem. And we have to realize that God has done something and will continue to do something about this. Now, whatever it is, you may, you know, for those who are watching on video, you may have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you have a sin problem. For those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they're struggling this morning, you may have a prideful problem. But whatever the case is, you come to God, you're in the house of God, you're beating your chest, and you're saying, finally, God be merciful to me, the sinner. The Bible says that this man went home justified. That's a legal term. What does justified mean? It means God, he puts down a, a law. He's saying, you have been forgiven, and nothing can overturn this. Justified, that's a legal term. You are justified. You know, when you're justified by God, that's a place, that's something you truly want to receive. Because it is not going to be overturned. The judge, the, the high priest, the, the most high judge, he says, you're justified. Amen. You know, he gives you forgiveness. He gives you freedom. And it's so important to live in that freedom. It's so important to live in that being justified by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yeah. The tax collector who stood in the back pew, he was aware of his sin. He was aware of the holiness of God. He was aware of the mercy that God was willing to give him that day. This man knew that it was time to change his ways. The only strength and the faith that he had, it brought him to the back pew. But friends, sometimes your strength and faith is very little, but that's all you have and that's all you need. Amen? That's a place for an amen. Some of us have very little strength. We have very little faith, but sometimes that's all you need, just a little. You know, God sowed a seed into you so long ago, but that word of God will not return void. Amen. As, there's, as long as there's breath in you, as long as you're on your feet, as your eyes are open, God is working with you. He is talking to you. He will meet you to the very end. I'm reminded of the thief on the cross. He was... On that cross, he knew he was a sinner. He knew that he had violated the law. He knew that he had received a, a death penalty, and that was, his, that was his price, I mean, his penalty. And th th that's the price he had to pay. But he looked at Jesus, and everybody was mocking Jesus. But he looked at Jesus in a whole different way. He knew he was a sinner. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, I tell you the truth, you will be with me in paradise. That, to me, says that Jesus, no matter what we've done, Jesus follows you to your very last breaths. Amen. But what a joyful thing it would have been for this thief to encounter Jesus a long time ago. Amen. What a joyful thing it would have been for this thief to, to have overturned and be justified and still had time to live on the earth and praise and give glory to God. Amen. He didn't have time to go to a Bible study. He didn't have time to do any of that. But God still forgave him because God searches the hearts. And we cannot fool God. And that's why it's so important to surrender your weaknesses, your, 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 your arguing, your complaining, everything, everything that's in you. Give it to the Lord because he knows it's there. He knows it's there. And that's a great thing. You know, you want joy? Well, give away that anger. You want joy? Give away that unrest. Give it to God. You want joy? Give away that doubt to God. You want joy? Give everything that's standing in the way. Give it to God. Give it away. Surrender. It's like, you know, make up your mind. I'm not going to live like that no more. I refuse to look at the way Satan wants me to look at things. 
And this tax collector, he, he had just enough strength to get into church. He st stood in the back and he beat his chest. Have mercy on me. You know what mercy means? You know, he takes something away from you that you deserve. He has mercy on you. He takes something away from you that you deserve. He takes away hell from you. You deserve hell, but he takes it away. And you know what grace means? He gives you something that you don't deserve. If you're listening right now and you feel like all you can do is beat your chest for the failures you have inside, friends, now is not a time to walk away. Now is a time to change. And God said through his son, he can make all things new. And there are, are there new things in your life? Let's look at Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Matthew became an apostle. He was a disciple who later became an apostle. And Matthew, he was another tax collector. Matthew has a beautiful story. But in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, it says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. You hear? Jesus was walking down the road, and Jesus saw a man by the name of Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. And how was Matthew? He was, he was, I, I look at him like this. He was like, he was just not happy no more. He was just leaning up. He had the booth, you know, like a lemonade stand kind of. And he was just, you know, watching people go by. Probably not even taxing anybody anymore because he's just, he's had it. He said, go ahead and go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You know, and so he said to him, Matthew, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. Sounds like a fairy tale, don't it? Here's Matthew, his life, his career, everything that used to make sense to him, he just gets up and leaves. He just gets up and leaves. All the security in the world. He just gets up and he leaves. You know, when Jesus says, follow me, we need to listen to those words and follow him. Amen. You know, now for Matthew, this was in regards to his salvation. But as you walk with Christ, as you carry your cross, there are going to be times when Christ will come up to you and say, hey, psst, follow me. We're going this way now. Hey, follow me. We're going to go this way now. And you need to follow. Because it's a journey. But for Matthew, he got up and followed Jesus. And then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, Matthew's house, later that evening, it says, Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. Why? Because Matthew knew all the tax collectors and Matthew knew all the sinners. Amen? So everybody, you know, think about it. When you become a Christian, before you became a Christian, everybody came to your house. Everybody liked to party. Amen? Somebody in the back said, Amen. He was at my house. But once you become a Christian, they all scattered north, east, south, and west. And you're like, hey, you know, and you're, you're, you're by yourself. But you see, this was Matthew's first day following Jesus. And everybody wanted to know why Matthew followed this guy, Jesus. So they all go to Matthew's house. Jesus is reclining. He's kicking back at the table. And it says here that, the, the, that they see, the Pharisees saw that Jesus was dining here. And it says, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors. The Pharisees showed up. Even the religious people showed up. Why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You know, the Pharisees, to a level, they knew God, but they were filled with pride in their own hearts. But see, here's the thing. They were sick in need of a, in need of a doctor, too, but they were rejecting the doctor. And so here's one thing I know about God. He knows when he's being rejected. Don't you know when you just know somebody don't like you? <laughs> you just know it. They, ain't told you, they haven't told you anything. 
that they haven't, you know, done anything to you, but you just know they do not like you. You just know that, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot of smiling faces there. You just know, there's something about this guy, he don't like me. You know what, and you're, you're like on your guard now, you know, what if he's, oh, he tells me something, I'm going to come right at him, you know. But Jesus knows those who don't like him. And so when Jesus was at this house, he knew that the Pharisees were just totally going to reject anything he had to say or do. But he went to the house and the tax collectors and the sinners were there. What were the Pharisees even doing there? They're being hypocrites. Well, who told you to come? But yet they were there. And so they're all in the house. And Jesus says, you know, I come to the sick, not to those who think they're all well or, or are well. You know, Jesus says, I come to those who are sick. You know, many of us are, are spiritually sick this morning. You know, we're, we're a little down in the dumps. Many of us are spiritually sick. And Jesus is that physician. He never removes his scrubs. He never removes his, 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 uh, his medical coat. You know what I'm saying? He is here in the house. He is here to serve. That's an important thing for people in ministry to hear. Christ serves. Amen. And people in the ministry serve. Amen. We come to every church gathering, every time the church comes together, even when you're on your own, as a Christian, you come to serve. You come to meet the needs of others because God has already met your need. And somebody may say, well, I still have this need. It's okay. You know, and I've come to learn through my life that as I, as I allow God to use me to meet the needs of others, God will take care of my needs while I'm focused on the needs of others. Amen. I've noticed that time and time and time again. But if you're focused on your need, you know, for Matthew to just get up and leave all that made sense to him, his career, his status in society, which was really not a good thing for being a tax collector, amen? But for a man to just come by and say, follow me, there was much more going on inside Matthew than the word allows us to read. But on that day, what finally made sense to Matthew was he needed a change. He needed a change. And that opportunity of change came when Jesus invited him for a walk. How's your walk going with Jesus today? How's your walk going with Jesus You know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as he came up to Matthew and said, follow me, he'll come up to us. And he said, follow me. You know, the Lord is going somewhere. These disciples that walked with Jesus, they followed him, but they didn't realize that he was going to a cross. But they followed him. And when he came towards the end of his journey, they scattered and abandoned him. I pray that's not your testimony because we're coming to, end, to an end of our journey. You see, for, for, for Judas and for Peter, they failed. At the end of, at, at, when Jesus came to the end of his journey, they scattered. And the church is coming to the end of its journey. And we're going to be approached to deny Christ. We're going to be approached to sell out. I just read of a story how a 70-year-old grandmother who owns her own floral shop, she, she had a long-time customer who was homosexual. And we're not at battle with homosexuals. But this one day, this customer tells her, I want you to do my wedding for me and my partner. And this cust the, the, the owner, this grandmother, just says politely, she takes his hand, she says, I'm sorry, but I cannot take part, uh, I cannot service your wedding because of my relationship with Jesus, but I can help, I can uh, refer three other good florists to you for your wedding. And because she did that, she's on the verge of losing her business. She's been fined $1,000 already, and she's on the verge of losing her business, her retirement, her life savings. This is in uh, the state of Washington. And see, it starts out with the legal process. See, the Pharisees were legal people. 
And the Pharisees came right to Jesus and tried to come against him and stop the flow of the grace of God. And see, so that's what's happening today. The enemy is trying to work through legal means to stop the flow of the grace of God. You know, basically what we're seeing happening before our very eyes is religious freedom being stripped away in America. That, that, that flag, that, that American flag has stood for, for religious freedom, you know, for freedom. And God wants you to be free. God wants you to freely choose him. Amen. He will not force himself on you. Amen. So God wants you to have religious freedom. God wants you to have freedom of speech. God does not want to be a master of puppets. God wants you to have all the freedom in the world so that way you can choose rightly and that you can have that place with him in heaven. And that's what, been so, that's what has been so great about this nation, that we have had that, but it's now starting to be taken away. But for Matthew, they lived in harsher times of persecution. They lived, they, they lived where they, they had to honor what the Romans said. But Matthew sat at his tax collector's booth and he knew that there was something that had to change. He was tired of ripping people off. He was tired of his company, his job, not honoring God. For you business owners that don't honor God in your company and you wonder why your company struggles, Because you compromise. Because God gave you that company. He freely gave it to you. And, and your career. R remember that the wisdom God gave you, Christian. He gave it to you to honor him. And this woman, if she stands her ground, this florist, she's going to have treasures in heaven because she's willing to not surrender and, and give in to the enemy. She's going to believe in what the Bible says. Because she said it out loud. I can't do this because of my relationship with Jesus. She didn't say, I'm not going to do this because I don't believe in that stuff. No, she said because of Jesus. Everything you have to do has to be because of Jesus. And you can't be influenced by what other people tell you. In a few weeks, I'll be teaching a class what it means to stand alone with God. Because we are going to have to learn this, be it that one day you're going to have to stand alone. And God's going to be all that you have to lean on. And right now he all is. But right now we have brothers and sisters to lean on. But one day we're going to be scattered to the ends of this nation. And, and you're not going to have no one to lean upon but God. And you need to learn now what it means to lean upon God and to trust not in your own understanding, but in his understanding and his wisdom. And so, Matthew had gotten to that point. That's why when he sees Jesus coming, he gets up and follows him. Let, this is what the word doesn't really show us. But if you really understand through the power of the Holy Spirit, Matthew had already been watching Jesus. Matthew had already seen Jesus. Matthew had already heard about Jesus. Matthew had his eye on Jesus. And so therefore, when Jesus came around, and said what he said to him, Matthew at that invitation. Because we can only come to Christ by invitation. Only the Holy Spirit can invite you. It's only the Holy Spirit who says, come. See, Jesus gave that invitation. Come, all who are weary, burdened, heavy, laden down. And I will give you rest. Come all to me who are thirsty. I will give you that drink of eternal water. Come, says the Bible. You know, this is that... This is that uh, incredible thing. If you go to the very last scripture, it says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. That's the end of the Bible. The Lord says he's coming. He's coming to what he has called. He has called us. He's given us a free invitation. And he says, Grace is with you today. Things that we don't deserve, God has given to us. Amen. His grace is with you today. And that day, Matthew was at his tax booth, and he was just down in the dumps. But he heard that invitation, and he went to it. You ever gotten an invitation to a wedding, to a party, and you just throw it away? 
That's what a lot of people are doing today with Jesus. They're just throwing that invitation away. Even people who claim to be Christians and that come to church all the time, they're just offering lip service. That's got to change, guys. That has to change. That has to change. Because at the end of the day, we got to understand we can't fool the Lord. And that's a good thing. You know, when, when, you, when you can sit down in your, in wherever your private place of prayer is, when you can just sit down and just be straight, honest, and open with Jesus, you know, that's a beautiful thing. And you can say, Father, forgive me. I really messed up today. I'm really ashamed of what I did, Lord. Please help me, Lord. You know, that's the most beautiful place to be. And God hears you, and he restores you, and he makes you stronger. And there you, therefore, you're not falling into a habitual lifestyle of sin. You're making the right decisions. You're going forward. You recognize the plan of God more and more with clarity. And so in Zacchaeus, the tax collector, we find his story in Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, verse 1. This is one of my favorite stories of the Bible. Because Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. <laughs> he wasn't just a millionaire. He was a billionaire. Amen. So if anybody had anything to lose was this guy because this guy had much. He was Matthew's boss. He was the guy that came, the, the guy, the tax collector that came in and beat his chest. Zacchaeus was that guy's boss. You know, Zacchaeus probably knew Pilate. You know, Zacchaeus knew some people in high places. But his story says in Luke 19, verse 1, it says, he entered Jericho, Jesus did, and was passing through. You know what I like about this story? Zacchaeus was in Jericho. And we know from the Old Testament that God knocked those walls down. Amen? See, God needs to knock down the walls that we, we put up. The walls that, and, that we put up in our heart and in our mind against God God physically knocked down the walls of Jericho in the days of Joshua. And he is doing that today with Zacchaeus. We put up a wall against God. No, I don't want to hear it, God. No, I don't want to hear it. No. But Zacchaeus was in Jericho. And it says, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector. And he was rich. <laughs> you know, just, and he was rich. I mean, this, I mean, you don't have to say that, Lord. We chief task later. Yeah, he rich. But the Lord wanted to make very clear he was rich, he had power, he had authority. This guy had it all. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. <laughs> he was a, not only a rich guy, but he was a short rich guy. I mean, I mean you ever seen the rich guys or a short? I mean, and you've seen those, those, I saw a TV commercial one time on and I a while back, and there was this, this, you know, please forgive me, but there was this short, chubby guy walking on a beach with this, with this young lady that had he not all that money, she wouldn't be hanging around him. But, but, you know, short, rich guy, you know, and he was probably chubby, I don't know, because, I mean, you have all the money in the world, you could eat steak or goat, whatever they ate every night, Amen. He was unable to see the, because of the crowd. He wanted to see Jesus. He had heard Jesus was coming. The tour of Jesus was coming into Jericho. He had wanted to see Jesus. He had heard about the miracles. He had heard about everything Jesus was doing. He probably heard about Matthew. Probably got Matthew's notice. Oh, Matthew ain't working. Oh, I got to replace Matthew. Oh, I got to replace the, the other tax collector that went and beat his chest in the temple. He walked out on me too. Man, I'm having to replace all these tax collectors because of Jesus. And then he starts to find out Jesus for himself. And so it says here, so he ran on ahead of the crowd and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him. For he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. For today, I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. 
And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back to him four times as much. Now, let me just stop there. This 1 through 10, verses 1 through 10, is a course of a whole day. Because at the beginning of the day, Zacchaeus heard, heard that Jesus is coming. So he climbs up a sycamore tree and he gets the attention of Jesus. Now, yesterday in our men's, in our men's meeting yesterday, I talked about Stephen the martyr in the book of Acts. And at the death of Stephen, at the death of Stephen, as Stephen was dying, they were throwing stones at Stephen. The Bible says that Stephen said, you know, look, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that when Jesus went to God, he sat at the right hand of the Father. But yet when Stephen sees Jesus, Jesus is standing, not sitting. Stephen's life made Jesus stand up and get the attention and give it to Stephen. You see, we can get God's attention. But the way we live our lives, good or bad, we get God's attention. God's eye is always on us. For Stephen, it was a good thing. Jesus was standing up. Stephen, just hang on probably. That's probably what he's telling Stephen in the spiritual realm. Hang on, Stephen. You're going to go through some hard things, but you're almost there, Stephen. And Stephen said, Lord, don't charge this sin against them. And he died. And so Zacchaeus, I need to see Jesus. The woman who had the issue of bleeding for 12 years, she went to all the doctors. She spent all her money on uh, herbal medicines and all this and all that to try and get rid of her, her pain that she had and bleeding that she had. But all she had to do was go to Jesus. That's all she had to do. And she reached out and touched him and she was healed. And some people can say, well, I've been doing that. That's a whole nother sermon. But Zacchaeus said, I need to see Jesus. I need to see Jesus. And he got up and he didn't care. Looking like a little five-year-old kid running up a tree. He didn't care. And let me tell you something, church. You're going to have to have the attitude of a five-year-old in this generation and not care what anybody says. And you're going to have to follow Jesus. Because they're going to make fun of you. Why are you going to Bible study all the time? Why are you always praying? Why are you always praying over your food? Why do you got to do all that? Why, 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 why? You must have the faith of a child. You must have the faith of a child to get the attention of Jesus Christ. And so Zacchaeus said, I don't care. I'm climbing up a tree. I'm going to get his attention. And he looked and Zacchaeus said, oh, I got to be at your house today, Zacchaeus. Of all these people I see, I got to go to your house. Who wants Jesus in their house for dinner? Amen. 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 Really, that means in your heart. Who wants Jesus in your heart, in your mind? You want that peace of God, that tranquility that only God can bring through his only son, Jesus Christ. And everybody comes, the grumblers, the Pharisees, the other tax collectors, the sinners, they all show up. Isn't it weird how they all show up at the same place at the same time? You know? It's kind of like this, you know. Uh, you got Christians who uh, sit in church on Sunday and they complain that so-and-so didn't come to church because he went to the football game there at Reliance Stadium. But yet, soon as church is over, he's going to go to his house and turn the TV on, watch TV and football game on TV. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, we're all gathered at the same place, man. You know, we're all doing that. And so, through the course of this dinner, Zacchaeus hears some things. His heart is exposed even more. And he knows it's a time to change. And that's why he says, it says that he stands up. And he said, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, which you know he did... <laughs> If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will get back to him four times as much. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I think the law, that that was the requirement of the law. I think it was three times as much, but he was willing to give back four times as much. That was the Old Testament law. So he was willing to go and above and beyond what the Old Testament law had taught. And so he was saying, 
I recognize my obstacles, my challenges, my sin, it's money. All my recognition, all my fame, all my fortune, all that I have, that was what was stopping me from knowing you, Jesus. And see, for some of us, it's not that. It may be something else. But Zacchaeus said, right here, right now, it's time to change. I'm giving up half of what I own. I'm giving it up. I'm going to make it right with anybody that I cheated. I'm going to make it right. You see, sometimes, Christians, you've got to go back and ask for forgiveness. Sometimes you've got to go back and make things right. And Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what, that which was lost. See, God knows who's lost. God knows who's lost. God knows who don't care. God knows who's looking the other way. God knows who's, who's just wandering, you know, wandering through life with no direction, no purpose. God knows every situation on earth. And yet, he still chooses to be intimate with you. And that is such a beautiful thing. And at the end of your day, throughout your day, stop where you stop what you're doing and just sit down and talk to Jesus. And it's time to change. You know, today may be the last day you live on this earth. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. Today may be the last day you live on this earth. I, want, I really want you to hear that. Every single person. You may say, no, I'm, I'm young. I'm only 20 or 15 or whatever. Today may be the last day you live on this earth. How do you want to finish this? Do you want to go out in victory? Yeah. You know, we're not, none of us are perfect. None of us. We all know our own weaknesses and struggles and oppressions that the enemy puts on us. But it's time to change. It's time to give it to Jesus. You know, if, if you know that you're weak in your prayer life, do something about it. Start talking to the Lord. If you know that you have a problem in your finances, what does that mean? You know, you can't trust God there. Start trusting God. If you have anger issues, if you have doubt issues, jealousy, whatever it may be, you know, you're, 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 failing, um, you're having a problem with pornography. That's a big one there. It's a big one, guys. Vile thoughts. Fornication. Adultery. Alcoholism. Drug addiction. I mean, so many things. We can go on and on and on and on and on. I've seen drug addicts know they're, they hate what they are. They hate what they're doing, but yet they, don't, they can't stop it. They cannot stop it. It's only through the blood of Jesus. And so the point of this whole message this morning is that it's time to change some things that don't belong in our lives. Surrender it. It's time to come to a point that says, I surrender. I surrender. And I, I, I don't care what the people say. You know, these tax collectors, they had their grumblers. They had the religious people grumbling at them. But you cannot let people influence you. You need to let God influence you. Amen. You need to let Jesus speak to your heart. And you need to follow what Jesus tells you to do. Because when you die... Only you are going to stand before Christ, nobody else. Not your spouses, not your friends, not your cousins, not your rubber ducky, nothing. Only you are going to stand between you and Christ, only you two. And that's a beautiful thing. God is your best friend. God is the lover of your soul. Christ is your redeemer. Christ is your Lord. Christ is your savior. He is your best friend. He's better than a best friend. 
When you're all alone and when you're crying and thinking nobody cares and nobody loves you, Jesus loves you. That is what has held me down throughout my, my, the past 10, 12 years. Jesus knows you. The, the one who created the heavens and the earth, he looks at you and he says, now this is my choice, masterpiece, creation. Stop listening to the devil. Our fight is with the devil. And he puts doubt. He puts confusion. He puts fear into you. And stop listening to him. Resist Satan. Resist the demonic spirits. Resist him. Run to God. Flee to God. And the devil will flee. When you stay in the presence of God, that devil don't, he's afraid of God. He's not afraid of you, but he's afraid of the Lord. And so when you're truly baptized into the Holy Spirit of God, you know, you, you, you know what you know. You're in the Spirit of God. You know, Satan will always try and tempt you. And God will always put you to the test. But when you're in the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, you're going to know what you got to do when you're put to the test. You're going to know what needs to be done. Amen? Amen? And it's time to change this once and for all. Let's get this signed, let's get this sealed, and let's get this delivered. The time is now. There's not much time left, church. Amen? Amen? Who's with me, church? You know what you have to do. You know what you have to do. And it's a time to do it. It's a time to do it. This message is going throughout all the churches, throughout all the churches, throughout all the churches. People that are hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. They're knowing that this life they live, is, it's, there's more to it. God has invested so much into you. Oh, Father, Father, you be glorified. Receive this message in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Give God.